1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul writes this, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that is and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister the lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before for god did not call us to be impure but to live a holy life therefore anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being but god the very god who gives you his holy spirit now about your love for one another we do not need to write to you for you yourself have been taught by god to love each other and in fact you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. And yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so, to do so more and more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that it's powerful, that it's active. We thank you for these words of Paul in this letter to the church at Thessalonica. That Lord, you would speak through these words to our hearts today and challenge us just as you did them. Lord, to pursue you with everything that's in us. To pursue you in a way that, that we grow strong and that we, we become more like you in everything that we say and everything that we do. And Lord, we just thank you for it in advance for your life-changing words in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in the fourth part of a series of messages. It's actually a five-part series that I've entitled Rock Solid. Next week, we're going to finish this series up by, by talking about how to thrive, how to thrive. But, but in order to be rock solid, you really need a good foundation. It's vital that you have a good foundation, and then you begin to build upon that firm, solid foundation. Now, for the last few weeks, we've talked about some of the foundational principles of building a life of character now what are they well obviously it begins with uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving salvation through him asking Jesus to come into your heart and life that's where it starts that's the initial seed and in, in, in all of this the initial step you know in saying Jesus I thank you for what you've done on the cross come into my life and be my savior and that's where it starts but it also involves other things like choosing role models it involves associating yourself with the right people and, and belonging to the right community it also involves a commitment to perseverance that if you want to become a person of character I'm talking about you know solid uh, reliable and a strong person you need to, de to decide today that you are in this for the long haul, that bailing out's not an option, but you're gonna stay with it. You're gonna go until the final bell rings. Now, these all provide a foundation for developing character. These are the foundational things. But today, I wanna talk about how you can build upon that foundation. In other words, how you can become stronger in your walk with Jesus Christ, how you can build on that foundation. Now, Paul build, uh, begins this section using a phrase that I really like. And, and I think this phrase is, is crucial in understanding uh, spiritual growth in our life, how we should approach spiritual growth. He says in verse number one, finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. Barclay actually translates this phrase, I want you to intensify your efforts more and more. Intensify these efforts. Now, Paul brings up the same idea actually in verse number 10. He says, and in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you brothers to do so more and more. And then again, Paul says something similar in the next chapter, in chapter 5, in verse 11. He said, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as you, in fact, are doing. Barclay says it again as he says, intensify your efforts. Paul is saying these are things that you do well. You're doing these things and you're doing them well, so keep it up. Do it more and more often until you get better at it until you've actually perfected yourself at it. This is a crucial principle in spiritual growth, folks. You grow by strengthening your strengths, by working on strengthening those strengths. Now, now, now most of you know that, that I love to play golf, okay? Now, I'm, I'm not very good at it, but I love to, to, to play it. It's a, it's a fun game 
to play. Now, I say I'm not very good at it, and, and I can't blame uh, my clubs. Uh, I can't blame the ball uh, for my shortcomings out on the golf course uh, because i got to tell you, the root of my problem is really the groundskeeper. Okay, They don't cut the grass in the areas that I am, am playing at. And so, and so because of that, I don't get the, the score that I would like to get when I'm playing a round of golf. Okay, So it's really the groundskeeper's fault. But anyway... Um, I remember when, when, when Gabriel, uh, my oldest son Gabriel, when he was, I think, in high school, he was working at the Country Club Golf Course there in our city. And, uh, and I remember having a conversation one time with the club professional. There were, uh, there were a lot of wealthy members at this, you know, at this country club, and, and this man makes an enormous amount of money uh, you know, helping it, uh, with these members improve their golf game you know, working with them to improve their hobby. And, and so I said something to this golf professional along this lines. I said, you know, I wish I had the money to, to be able to hire you to spend a few hours with me out on the golf course and, and because it's going to take you at least a couple of hours to tell me everything that I'm doing wrong. And he looked back at me, and here's what he said. He said, that's not how it works. I said, what do you mean that's not how it works? He said, the objective is not to tell you everything that you're doing wrong. He said, the objective is to get you to repeat everything that you're doing right. He said, if I, if I only tell you to stop doing something and that you need to stop doing something that's wrong, you are going to just replace that bad habit with another bad habit. He said, the truth of the matter is, you've made some good golf shots before when you've been out playing. You just need to repeat those steps correctly each time that you swing the club. And when you do that, your golf game is going to improve. Now, folks, i got to tell you something. That, this is really probably, in my opinion, the best-kept secret about living the Christian life. It's also, I think, the best-kept secret uh, of raising kids or having a good marriage or leading a team to victory or really you know, becoming successful in any venture that you're doing. You have to identify what it is that you are doing right, and, you, and then you intensify your efforts. You work on that. Now, you, you know, you, you're probably used to maybe a different model, you know, one where other people, you know, berate you and, 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 and you beat yourself up for every single mistake, you know, where the focus is, is, is on just not doing the bad stuff, you know, getting rid of the bad stuff in your life. But believe it or not, that's not how you succeed in building the Christian life. In, in, in becoming a solid, rock-solid Christian. Now, clearly, one of the goals in becoming a, a godly Christian is to uh, get the bad stuff out of your life. I mean, that's one thing that we want to do. However, there is a right way to go about it. There's a right way to do it, and the right way is not for us to direct all of our attention on what's wrong, but it is to direct all of our attention on what we're doing right and, and, and improve and strengthen and grow in that area that we're doing right, in the things that we're doing right. Now, back to, to the example of, of golf, okay? I used to, when I used to, I remember years ago, I used to golf with a guy that absolutely drove me crazy. I mean, he would just drive me insane. It, it, and what would happen is when I would approach to, to hit the ball and I would get ready and I would be addressing the ball, I would be standing there and this guy would, he would begin to go elbows in, you know, don't lock your knees, you know, loosen up your grip. He would say, you know, lower your head, uh, uh, you know, uh, straighten up your back and, and be sure and keep your head down all the way through and then follow all the way through and on and on. And, and finally, I asked the guy, I, I said to him, I said, don't you have enough sense to not antagonize somebody who has something in their hand that could be a weapon? But this was this guy's model of leadership. You know, to, put, to point out everything that, that, that's wrong. Everything that's going wrong. And, and you know, that's how many people, I think, approach the Christian life. In other words, it's all about what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong in my life? And, and, and what, what happens in that situation is that becomes their entire focus. That's what they're focused on. You know, all the mistakes, all of the ways that they're missing the mark becomes their focus until the, their Christian life becomes more about measuring our failures than it does about experiencing victories. Okay? And, and that's how many people approach relationships as well, I might add. You know, the, 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 where all we can see is, is, is what we're missing. All we can see is what, what's wrong with how, you know, their needs are not being met. 
And, and, and no relationship can thrive under that kind of a model. Listen, if you want to grow strong in your Christian life, you need to approach your spiritual growth in the right way, the biblical way. You know, not like my, you know, my well-meaning, you know, golfing buddy, you know, where you're pointing out everything that's wrong, but like the successful uh, uh, golf pro that I mentioned earlier. You strengthen your strengths. In other words, you zero in on what you're doing right, and you just continue to do it better and better and better. Now, does that mean that you ignore your weaknesses? You know, no, a thousand times no. You, you don't ignore your weaknesses. The more you expand, though, on doing right, the more you focus on doing right, the smaller your weaknesses become. Let me say that again. The more that you are focusing on what you do, you do right, of, you know, and on doing right, the smaller your weaknesses become. You know, imagine that um, a Christian life, it, our Christian life is, it, is like a golf shot, okay? Like, you know, hitting a golf shot. Now, every golfer, no matter, you know, who you are, every golfer, even the bad ones, they know what it's like to hit a shot well, occasionally. Every so often, you, you hit it right, okay? You do it right. And, and according to one expert I know, the best way for a golfer to get better at golf is to focus on what you're doing right, on what you did when you hit it right, and then try to repeat that as often as possible. Listen, it is the same way in the Christian life. That's what we do in the Christian life. Every believer here has experienced a time in their spiritual life where everything was, I mean, everything was just clicking along. Everything was just working. I mean, it was falling into place. Everything was like going exactly the way that it should be going. Your spiritual life was just, boom, taking off like a rocket. And so the question really is, what were you doing right at this time in your life, and how can you repeat that habit today? How can you focus on that habit? You know, there are times when I am on target spiritually, and then there are those other times when I'm, I'm a little off center. You know what the difference is? When, when I get off center, it's usually because I've, I've stopped taking, you know, the perfect swing at the Christian life. I've stopped, and, 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 and my focus has shifted in the wrong direction. I'm, I'm focusing on the wrong things. Listen, when we keep Jesus Christ front and center, when we keep his word, when I keep his word hidden in my heart, you know, and I, and I abide in his presence, I, I, I keep a conversation going with him all throughout the day, what I find is that my spiritual life thrives. I'm growing spiritually. When I'm in fellowship with other believers and when I, you know, make it a point to, to talk about things with other people that are, that are edifying and, and, and I seek out wisdom from people that, that know a little bit more about life than I do, I find that my spiritual life thrives. But when my focus shifts to secondary matters, I find that my Christian life suffers. When, it begins to, when I begin to focus on things that I shouldn't be, things that, that are wrong in my life, and I begin to put all the focus there, my Christian life suffers. And so Paul says in verse 1, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. As Barclay says, intensify your efforts here. Focus on these things. So here's what I'm challenging you to do. Take a long, hard look at your life and then ask yourself, what am I doing right? What am I doing right? You have the courage to do that, to ask yourself, what is it I'm doing right? Now, for some people, this may be new territory. I mean, you're not probably maybe used to, to thinking of terms of what is it I'm doing right, especially when it comes to the Christian life. You know, for some people that, you know, your entire concept maybe of Christianity has been built all your life on focusing on all your sins and all your shortcomings and all the things you got to get rid of in your life, all the things that you're doing wrong. Well, today I want to challenge each one of us to, to follow Paul's example and to take Paul's advice when he says, identify what it is that you're doing right and then intensify your efforts there. Do it more and more. So try this when you're doing this. Finish this sentence. Say, I know that God is pleased with me when I blank. Okay, I know that God is pleased with me when I blank. You know, what would you say? Maybe some of you would say, well, I know God's pleased with me when I, when I spend time in his word. When I'm in his word, I know God is pleased with me. Or, or I know God is pleased with me when I give. Or I know God is pleased with me, you know, when I play catch with my son. Or I know God is pleased with me when I, you know, whatever. 
whatever it is for you. Fill in that blank and then do that as often as possible. Listen, the focus of our life should not be on, on the things that are wrong in our life. Our focus should be on doing the things that please God. On doing those things, instead of constantly just berating ourselves over everything we do wrong, let's look at what we're doing right and then do it more and more and more. Now, am I suggesting that we become laissez-faire in, in, in our attitude towards sin? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But what I'm saying is this, the more you focus on, on doing right, the more you strengthen your strengths and the stronger you become and the weaker uh, sin becomes in your life. And so it's a, there's a crucial dis distinction, I think, that needs to be made. And, the, and, and when, we, when we distinguish that, it, it will determine how successful we are in our Christian walk. Now, in, first, uh, in the first uh, 12 verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul mentions areas in which we need to strengthen our strengths, where we need to focus on strengthening our strengths. Now, the, these three areas you might be weak in, you may feel inadequate in, but, but I want you to remember the golf swing, okay? Remember the golf swing, and, and, and you identify what it is that you're doing right, and then intensify your effort there. And, and, and just pursue uh, those things. You know, what, that's what we're going to do in these three areas, all right? So let's get to it. The first thing, and, and it's a biggie, the first thing is this, things that you need to pursue, and that is pursue sexual purity. Number one, pursue sexual purity. Look what he says in verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. Now, in the original Greek, uh, that phrase, control his own body, is actually a colloquialism, uh, and it can be translated this way, that you should learn to live with your own wife in a way that's holy and honorable. Now, both interpretations really point to the same principle, and that is that we are called to live sexually pure. Now remember, Paul didn't write this letter to uh, the make-believe town of Mayberry, you know, where Gomer Pyle thought that he had to marry Thelma Lou because she kissed him on the jaw one day, okay? He's not writing to those kind of people. Paul wrote this letter to a society that was much like ours today. A society where sexual purity and, and marital fidelity were, were foreign concepts. In, in fact, in those days, it was actually assumed that a man could have and should have as many partners as he wanted. That was the culture. That was the thought of the culture. And, and, and in fact, uh, Demosthenes wrote this, that we keep prostitutes for pleasure, we keep mistresses for day-to-day -day needs of the body, we keep wives for the begetting of children and for the faithful guardianship of our homes. That was the prevailing attitude that women basically serve three purposes and all of them involve sex. And so Paul comes along here and Paul says, take responsibility for yourself. Take control of your body. Treat the opposite sex with, with, with holiness and with honor. And then he says in verse number six, in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. Now, I gotta tell you, when he says brother here, th does that mean he's only talking about men? No, he's actually using it in a very generic sense. Uh, it, it was very common to refer to both brothers and sisters, both sexes. And so he was saying no one should wrong his brother or sister or take advantage of him or her. Let me ask something. Do you know what, do you know what it means to be sexually pure? Do you know what it means to be even sexually responsible uh, to your spouse and with your spouse? Now, I, I, I personally believe that a majority of us in this room know the answer to that question. I believe that we understand that. But let me just say this and, and, and move on from here. I, but regardless of what our modern culture says, pornography is a sin. It's wrong. It's wrong. Pornography is a destroyer of every good thing. It never satisfies. It never brings positive results. In fact, if, if you are in the, the class, the upstairs class, uh, Louis Giglio, in, in the book that you're studying, he made this, this statement. He said, it is a soup, pornography is a super short-term high for an insecure soul. It affects the brain, it affects the heart, and it really affects your entire world. And unfortunately, I, I, I bring this up because pornography is big business today, and it is one of the major motivational factors behind the epidemic of human sex trafficking in our world today. So regardless of what the world says, folks, 
we, we do not treat people as objects. We're not to entice or encourage the taking advantage of other people, especially for selfish gains. And, and, and Paul says in verse 7, God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. So in this passage, Paul's really just reminding us that we are to behave in an honorable and in, in a holy way. And that includes avoiding sexual immorality in any form. You know, this may be a battle that you lose too often. It might be an area that you really, you know, feel very weak in. But I want you to ask yourself in this situation, what am I doing right? It, I mean, in those moments that I have victory, what are the steps that are leading up to it? What are the things that are leading up to it? What do I do right and how can I get better at it? That's what Paul is telling us to focus on. And let me just say, uh, for those that are married in this room today, th th this is a great time to open the door to communication with one another and, and to just be open and say, hey, I want to treat you with the honor that you deserve. You know, help me to identify those things that I do right. But the call to live sexually, a sexually pure life, it's a challenge for us today. I mean, there are so many sexually impure things that are just trying to pull us in a million different directions. And, and it's difficult. You know, I, I want you to realize it's always been difficult. In every generation, in every culture, it has always been difficult, but it's never been impossible. You can have victory. That's every believer's birthright. So how do you get there? Well, you strengthen your, your strengths. You identify what it is that you're doing right. You identify what it is that works best for you, and you keep doing it. Okay? So the first thing to, that you need to pursue in growing in character is to take sexual uh, uh, purity seriously. The second building block, number two, is to pursue a loving heart. Number two, pursue a loving heart. Look at verse 9. Paul says, now about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia, and yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. See, Paul says it again here. He says, you're doing this well, guys. Now, keep at it. Do it more and more. Intensify your efforts. Pursue this. Make sure you're growing at this. You know, you don't need to, 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 to I, I don't need to sell you on the, uh, idea this morning that we should love one another you know I think we get it every Christian recognizes that that's our responsibility we're supposed to love one another but what I want to encourage you to do today is to excel in this area in, to excel in this area of love look at everything that you are doing right but don't leave it at that don't just leave it at that don't say you know what I've done my portion I've done enough but instead, look at everything that you're doing right, and then you've got to ask yourself, how can I do more? How can I grow in this particular area of, 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 of love? You know, how can I uh, show my kids uh, more effectively how much that I love them? How can I uh, demonstrate my love in a greater way for my spouse? Or how can I, you know, love my neighbors and, and my friends and my coworkers with, with a greater love? You know, with a love that, that it's like the love of Jesus Christ to them. And Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So a, a crucial uh, pursuit in the process of spiritual growth is that we learn to live a life of love, that we love one another, that we love others. I got to tell you a few weeks ago in my devotional time, I read about a missionary. And this missionary uh, would read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know the love chapter, right? Okay, she would read 1 Corinthians 13, but she would be reading verses 4 through 8, uh, which lists the 16 characteristics of love. And, and, and for the word love in those four verses, for the word love, she would substitute her own name. She would put her own name in there instead of the word love. And, and when she would start to read a character, a characteristic that she knew uh, was not true of her, uh, she, she would have to stop. And her goal, her aim, was that one day she would be able to get through the entire list of those four verses of those 16 characteristics of love using her name in front of each one of those characteristics. Now, for example, verse, it's four short verses, and, and, and those four verses start this way. Love is patient. Okay? So that day when I read that, I thought that is an incredible idea. I love it. And so I decided I would put my own name in there and do that myself. And so I started out, and I said, Scott is patient. Now, I don't think it, came to, it comes to any surprise to anybody in this room 
that I had to stop there. Because if you know me very well, you know that's something I'm working on. But I want to encourage each one of you in this room to, to begin to pursue a loving heart. To take really those four verses in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, and, 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 and to take those and, 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 and replace the word love with your own name. Put your own name in there. You know, and, and see if you can get through the 16 characteristics. See how long it takes you to be able to, to, be able to, to, to say with all honesty that I, I am this and I am that. So growing in character involves pursuing a loving heart. Now here's the third building block. Number three, pursue a quiet life. Number three, pursue a quiet life. Paul says something here that, that really kind of surprised me the first time that I read it because it seemed to almost say the opposite of what I thought that a Christian life should be. He said here in verse 11, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work uh, with your hands just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so you will not be dependent on anybody he says a quiet life you know in my mind I'm thinking I thought we we're supposed to be witnessing all the time telling other people about Jesus you know shouting from the rooftops and and crying out against evil in the world and 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 raising up a ruckus until we see change take place and pointing out everything that's wrong in the world and you know giving the devil a black eye and and, and all of those things and instead what's Paul say you know he says just do your own job mind your own business and take care of your own responsibilities he uses a phrase here I think that's real important for us to notice in verse 11. Why do we do this? So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. Look at that phrase, your daily life. You know something? It is easy to impress people once in a blue moon. It's easy to impress people even when you only see them once a week. But when, you, when they see your daily life, I mean, how you do your job, how you talk to your kids, how you treat other people on a day-in and day-out basis, if after a close-up daily view of your life, you're still able to earn their respect, let me tell you, it says something about who you really are. There's another phrase here that we can't afford to ignore either that Paul uses. He says, mind your own business. You know, I got to tell you, there's, there, there, there's something about our culture today that I just really don't understand for the most part. And that is the desire to know all the intimate details of per, the personal lives of people. We want to know everything that's going on in everybody's life. You know, I remember it used to be that, 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 that we would just be infatuated with famous people, you know, athletes and, and celebrities. And, 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 and I guess to some degree we still are. But, but I never really understood the need to know all of the intimate details and ins and outs of a famous person. And now we have social media and social media platforms have caused our culture to become so consumed with the intimate details of everybody's you know, personal lives to the point, and let me just say it goes both ways. It goes both ways. You know, the current culture that we live in is such that many people feel the need to share all of their intimate details of their lives and, 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 and how they're feeling and, 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 and what they're thinking. And, 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 and some people feel that, that they have the right to, you know, to state their opinion about everything and everyone and they have the right to loudly share that opinion on social media or even in person. And Paul makes it pretty clear right here that if you're not directly involved, mind your own business. Mind your own business. Besides, you don't know the whole story anyway, so who are you to, to, to be involved or try to be involved or to judge? I, I think the problem is, is that we carry this, this, this curiosity of other people's lives, of what's going on in everybody else's you know, life, that we carry that into the workplace. We carry it into the neighborhood. We carry it into the church, and somehow, what happens is we begin to think that it is okay for us to, uh, to discuss and to analyze the lives of other people. And, and the more we vocalize and the more we, you know, especially our opinion, what happens is the more out of whack it gets. And it just gets more and more out of whack. And, and, and there's a word for this. It's gossip. It's gossip. And the, you know the Bible has a word for gossip? It's sin. It's sin. 
And there are people in the church who think that they have a right to pry into the private lives of their friends, their neighbors, their co-workers, famous people, celebrities, whoever. And Paul's response to us, to this, this situation, is very direct. He says, mind your own business and take care of your own responsibilities. He says in verse number 11, make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands just as we instructed you before. That's the New Living Translation. You know, some people go, Pastor, I really liked you until right now. <laughs> but you know, I think Paul's speaking to us today in this passage. And I, I think it's something we need to think about. What do we need to pursue? We need to pursue a quiet life. Sometimes we can be, we, 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 can, we can try to, you know, show Jesus, and then two minutes later we're talking about somebody that we don't even know all the details about. And what does that say to that person we just witnessed here? And I think Paul's saying, listen, make sure that your, your life is lining up all the way around. And if you're not involved, if you're not, if you're not part of the solution, if you're not involved, then, then, then live a quiet life. You know, we need to pursue that quiet life. So with that said, and everybody mad at me, um, in closing, I didn't say it, by the way, Paul did. But in closing, we, you know, we talked about some areas really this morning, three particular areas that we need to pursue in advancing towards spiritual maturity. One is to pursue, pursue sexual purity. You know, in other words, you take control of your body. Whether you're married, whether you're single, you need to treat other people with holiness. You treat other people with honor. The second was uh, to, to pursue learning to love other people. Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love is no one than this that he laid down his life for his friends. So we're, you know, we, we are called to lay down our lives, you know, in, in, maybe in, in, in certain ways, maybe in, through sacrifice or, 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 or service, but for our Christian brothers and for other people. In other words, we're, we're called to place other people's needs before our own and then to love them as Christ loved us because that's what Jesus did for us. And then the third is to pursue a quiet life. We're called to do our own job, take care of our own responsibilities, and as Paul put it, to mind our own business. In other words, to keep our nose out of the business of other people. You know, to earn the respect of other people, really through uh, the integrity of our daily life. You know, how we live our life day in and day out. So how do you go about pursuing these things? Well, remember the golf swing, okay? Remember that golf swing. What do we do? We strengthen our strengths, and you build on that. You keep building on that. You look for the things that you're doing right, and then you do it more and more and more. Paul says in verse 1 there, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. So really the question that every believer needs to ask himself is what am I doing right? What is it I'm doing right, and how can I learn to do it better? How can I improve that? I want to be the kind of Christian that's a blessing to other people. I want to focus on helping other people to be, to be like Jesus with skin, to be the best that they can be, to be like Jesus Christ. I want to avoid gossip. I want to mind my own business so that my daily life lets the light of Jesus Christ shine everywhere it goes. And so that when people see me, they don't see me, but they see the light of Christ shining through me into the darkness of their world. They can know there's hope. They can know that Jesus is their answer. How do we do it? We build upon that character building through pursuing purity, love, and a quiet life. So I'm going to ask with every head bowed, every eye closed in this room. As I said earlier, that foundation begins with accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't done that before you leave this room today, I want to encourage you to say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior, and he'll do it. It's that simple. He paid it all. He gave his life upon the cross of Calvary so that you and I could have forgiveness of sins, a, a, a new start, a, a, be born again, a fresh start. That's how much he loves us. Paul's telling us to build upon those foundations, to build a, a, a life of character, a life of holiness. How do we do it? We pursue purity. We pursue love and loving other people and we pursue a quiet life letting our light his light shine through us let it shine through our lives through our actions 
who are doing the right thing. So Heavenly Father, today we ask you to help us to build on those foundations that Paul's been talking about to this point. That, Lord, we would pursue these things with everything that's in us. Because, Lord, we want more than anything else for our daily life, our day in and day out life, everything that we do in those day, daily moments to reflect Christ. That Jesus, you would shine through us. And that we would not do one thing in our life that would hinder. That we would focus on, on improving those things that we're doing right. That we would, we would not focus on everything we're doing wrong and, and, and allow our attention to constantly go there. But Lord, we'd place our attention on, on, on pursuing the things that we're doing right. And making those things better and better until the wrongs are completely gone. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your kindness toward us. We ask God that we would continue to live a life of victory because you brought that victory to us. And Lord, even as next week we talk about how we can thrive in the Christian life because of that victory. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.